first, I would like to thank um, the speakers, um, Willy, um, Captain Santo, and also uh, Convo for a very insightful delivery just now. But one thing you may note is that among the processes and the technology, underpinning it, what is the most important is actually people. Therefore, that brings us to uh, today's uh, panel session, and I'm very heartened to have a panel of distinguished uh, panelists um, to discuss this very important topic. So before I start, maybe allow me to share some statistics and why this is an important point. Um, based on IIC Square 2022 workforce study, actually the cybersecurity workforce is about 4.7 million people reaching its highest level globally. However, the same study also found that there's a need for another 3.4 million. So let me repeat the figure. You have 4.7 million, you need another 3.4. We're only, only about 50% strength. There lies the importance of today's um, topic where we would like to have uh, insights and tap the brain of our um, panelists. So um, what I will do is that maybe I will start off with, uh, pardon me, I part of with a first question um, that I'll put forth to the panelists. And um, I would like them to give their views on this very important topic. So the first qu the question that I would like to put forth to the panelists is this. What do you see as the greatest challenge in strengthening cyber talent and capability developments in the context of a maritime industry? So maybe I will start off with um, the um, class society um, uh, colleagues. We're starting off with Michael and then uh, Kato, Captain uh, Saito, and then with uh, Kwang Vu, Martin, and then uh, Dr. Wei Han. So maybe we can start off with Michael first. Thank you. Can I have the uh, slides on, please? So I have prepared uh, a couple of slides just to uh, show our perspective on uh, how strengthening the cyber talent and capabilities development is uh, being um, affected both by what is happening at the moment. So uh, at the moment, there is a multidimensional evolution on the maritime domain um, that is affecting the um, capability development and the uh, talent uh, that is needed on the sector. So that uh, evolution is uh, twofold. So uh, on one side, there is the uh, maritime regulatory evolution. Uh, it's, uh, what I have here is uh, very much related to what uh, Captain uh, Saito said. Uh, so we used to have the IMO uh, resolution, which came out in uh, 2017, and it was uh, more generic in uh, in what it was asking. And now I have the new IEX regulations that they are becoming more focused. They are looking to the ship life cycle all the way from the ship uh, uh, design, uh, development, commissioning to the operational life cycle. We are uh, seeing there in the unified requirements very specific technical measures and mandatory implementation for the uh, new ships. Also have the uh, technology evolution uh, that is shaping the maritime uh, domain. So it, the uh, 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 evolution in digital technologies, which are becoming more advanced, more available, uh, cost effective, a maritime industry under pressure to uh, improve efficiency, reduce cost, enhance safety, uh, and security, the growing demand for uh, transparency, so all the things that we can see. So that leads, that's the uh, last slide, I'm not going to take much longer. So that leads us to the challenges. So there is a demand for qualified professionals. We have a rapidly evolving uh, landscape. We have the difficulty in adapting between IT and uh, cybersecurity technology for the operational technology on board. It's also related to what uh, Dr. Kwang said about the uh, differences in the legacy protocols. And then you have the difficulty to justify the budget 
and um, the difficulty in retaining the talent uh, with the competition with all the markets. Uh, it took too long, but uh, uh, we had agreed to sh kind of set the stage with those slides, so I hope I did that. Thank you. No problem. It's uh, in good time, Michael. So if I may ask uh, Kepo Saito-san to comment. Thank you, Chair, and uh, again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, regarding uh, cyber talent and uh, capabilities, I think each sector in maritime industry we require a different cyber talent and capability. For example, shipbuilding industry will be required to understand the unified requirement by IAX, and the ship equipment industry to understand the different requirement, and the ship manager to set up the governance and the management for cyber regions, not only for ashore side, but also their fleet, and the crew on board to carry out the cyber risk management on board. However, unfortunately, each sector in the maritime industry does not have the enough cyber security expert to develop each cyber talent and capabilities in order to create cyber resilience shipping industry. So from short short-term point of view, we have to invite cybersecurity experts to each maritime sector to learn what is the cybersecurity in general. And from long-term point of view, we have to train and develop maritime cybersecurity experts in each sector. In addition, it is necessary to provide cyber knowledge and skills for young students in maritime academy who will be become maritime expert in the future. So we are communicating and asking about collaboration with the academia as widely as possible to share our knowledge and experience for young students. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So now if I may invite uh, Kwon Vu to give your comments on these questions. Yes, thank you, Ching Peng. Uh, so Many things are already uh, mentioned by my uh, previous uh, speakers. Uh, in my opinion, for example, uh, uh, to enhance uh, the uh, uh, ability of the cyber talents, one possibility is, of course, to, to train them. Uh, but uh, because of the disruption of the cybersecurity, uh, you have uh, to regular train uh, um, these uh, uh, people, and uh, that is the point. Uh, the training, the re regular training of, uh, of the staff uh, requires uh, money and time. And as mentioned uh, before in my presentation, uh, the ecosystem, the stakeholder in the uh, uh, many time uh, uh, industry is uh, very uh, uh, different, with different uh, uh, understanding and awareness. So that is the first uh, uh, challenge. You don't have uh, the appropriate uh, uh, resources within the um, uh, maritime industry. The second point is how to train effectively the staff. One possibility is uh, training on doing. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, cyber security and, uh, uh, specialists uh, could uh, perform um, uh, penet uh, penetration tests on internal system. But uh, this is uh, dangerous to perform tests on, the, on the, the productive system. So if you would like to perform penetration tests, so only on, the, for example, the test system or simulation. And that is the second point. Because, uh, uh, for example, for OT system, you don't have um, a simulation of the uh, uh, test system for OT system within the maritime uh, industry. For example, in the uh, aviation industry, you have uh, um, uh, simulation for the, uh, for the control of, uh, of flight system. 
but such a simulation uh, uh, doesn't exist in the uh, many time industry. So that is, for, in my opinion, the second uh, challenges. At last but not least, after leverage the, uh, uh, the skill of the cyber um, uh, specialists, you have to keep them in your company. And the market from the cyber specialists is very competitive. And the average salary in the uh, maritime in industry is not so high as uh, in other sectors such as aviation or financial services. So that is, in my own opinion, the last challenges. Thank you. Okay, well, um, first, uh, thank, thank you for having us here on this uh, important topic. Uh, this is um, a critical business risk today. And the reason for me saying that is because when I'm out there, I, I come from uh, Sweden, Port of Gothenburg, um, Port Authorities. When I'm out there talking to partners and, and suppliers and, and all different kind of businesses, there's a big gap. Not everyone see this as a business risk. Some think of it as a technology risk, as an IT risk, and that's not the case. Uh, the cybersecurity is a risk for our businesses. So, uh, thank you. Well, um, challenges when it comes to uh, cyber talent, there are many and many has already been said. Um, I'm thinking of uh, one that is the board of directors and the executives, and not the fact that they should have specialities in cyber talent. That's not what, I, not what I'm saying. But they need to understand that this is an important topic, an important matter. Uh, that's not always the case, I believe. Another challenge is uh, time in our own businesses, because awareness for example, is a really, really important thing. All employees need to have an awareness on this topic. And that is time consuming. Uh, and time costs. We all know that. So time is another challenge. Cyber talent shortage has already been said. It's a tough business and very competitive, as, as you said. Um, and that's another challenge, of course. I think um, the last challenge I want to, to mention is um, business know-how. Because when it comes to cybersecurity and cyber, cyber talent, the talents sometimes tend to be a bit technical. And it's really, really important to get the business perspective so that we do the right choices, focus on the business crown jewels, so to speak, uh, and making the right priorities. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I have Dr. Behan to give his views. Uh, right. Yeah, so uh, thank you for having me here. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll continue from that point, actually, on uh, the yeah, that um, cyber talents. Now, if we look at it from the perspective of a university, uh, we, for example, in SIT, we, we do have a cybersecurity degree program, but when we train, we train for everyone. We train cybersecurity people in general, and the maritime industry is just another industry, and that's where competition happens, right? Everyone wants cybersecurity talents, and yeah, here we have, uh, for example, maritime industry uh, also needing this talent. So the the the, num the numbers challenge is, is real. Uh, we we want to produce as many graduates as we can, but we are you know we are limited in terms of number of people that we can produce. And these people go out to the industry. They they choose whichever where, where they want to go to, whether finance, uh, you know, uh, aviation, uh, maritime, and so on. Okay, but uh, there's uh, one thing that um, we could do from a maritime perspective to, to help the situation. And it's that uh, in terms of getting students familiarized with the, with the environments, 
So sometimes we see that you know, hey, students may not want to go into a particular uh, sector because we're not, they're not so familiar with the sector. Right? So this is where, like, for example, partnerships between uh, the maritime industry and the universities come in uh, very useful. Um, and one way to do it, I mean, the lowest hanging fruit would probably be, for example, in terms of internships. Uh, internships in some universities are short. In some universities, we have it like year-long internships, which uh, means that we send our students out for, for a year to work in a particular company, uh, and then they graduate and they can continue with the company if a uh, you know, company finds them suitable. So this is one avenue where partnerships can happen. Um, the maritime industry offer jobs, uh, internship opportunities, let these uh, students go out there, experience what it's like, gain experience, know what uh, regulations, know what the ground rules are in the, in the sector, and then after that, uh, continue uh, from there. Okay. Um, in addition to that, there's also uh, further partnerships in terms of uh, capability development, in terms of the things like contents and so on. Um, like what I said, we teach, for example, in cybersecurity, if I teach penetration testing, um, I'm going to teach it in a, in a quite generic manner, like, okay, how to, how to hack a server, how to uh, then, you know, how, how to pivot into different systems and so on, okay? The maritime industry may have uh, a little bit of requirements of their own. Um, for example, okay, systems are implemented in certain ways. And then there's also OT systems that uh, are a little bit different because OT systems uh, in cyber... Uh, when we talk about OT systems, uh, things like availability is very high priority, okay? Uh, availability and integrity is a very high priority, whereas some other systems may value confidentiality a little bit more. So knowing that, uh, partnering with uh, uh, academia and uh, the sector partnership will come in handy when you develop contents uh, or you know, things that are more suited uh, towards uh, this particular sector. Thanks. Um, there's quite a few points that was covered. We talk about um, the importance of business risk. Actually, cybersecurity is not just a security risk, but actually it has to fit in into a business, then it will make sense. And um, surprisingly, there's a lot of uh, senior management that needs to be socialized on cybersecurity so that the appropriate resource can be given to the uh, CIO or the CISO teams in, in investing into systems, importantly, the people, because as you mentioned, time. You have eight hours in the office, how do you get that eight hour, a part of eight hours to go into training for cybersecurity? You have to link back to business. If I may just circle back to a point that Michael has made with regards to regulations. So if I may just pose the question to you, Michael. So how do you see regulatory and technology evolution on cyber domain affecting the maritime industry, especially in terms of cyber talents and uh, capability development, Michael? Can I have your views on this, please? Thank you. Uh, we, we have to admit that the maritime sector is a heavily regulated one. So uh, it's also what uh, the other uh, fellow panelists have already mentioned, that uh, you, do have, uh, you do get cyber talents, but then it's uh, difficult to, to combine that knowledge in IT systems with the reality on board or the reality in the boards. So you might have uh, excellent uh, professionals, but um, in terms of IT knowledge, IT expertise, but it's uh, difficult sometimes to, uh, to bring them on board, to, to actually educate them, uh, to uh, um, make them uh, understand the, the business perspective. Uh, especially when you're talking about cybersecurity uh, on the vessels, it's a whole different story um, because it's about the um, operational technology which poses challenges. It's about uh, having a legacy systems that usually uh, uh, we see on the OT domain. Uh, so protecting legacy systems with uh, tools that they have been built for the office environment, that makes it uh, difficult. And this is also why, for example, trainers, uh, trainships or you know, partnerships with, uh, with academia could uh, really assist us. So you can take the uh, IT expertise, take personnel, people with IT expertise, bring them on board, uh, give them a period of grace, uh, if you wish, and uh, educate them in, uh, in the maritime reality. So things like uh, that uh, come into mind. Thank you. So um, 
it's, it's quite important to, to make sure that um, in, the, in the way of our regulatory environment that you mentioned, there's also at the same time as regulation tends to be behind the curve, some would say, uh, behind the technology evolution. And uh, Convo actually just now touched on the part about the fact that um, how do we convert existing staff who are IT trained into cybersecurity? And the key important point is how do you retain them? If I may pose the next challenge in the question is this. So um, with this rapid development in artificial intelligence, some segment have been asking this question on, in the next 10 years, do we still need cyber specialists? Actually, in operation unit in 10 years with the growth of uh, artificial intelligence? What's your view on this, Kwang uh, Thank you, Ching Pen. This is, uh, in fact, a very interesting question. Uh, 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 for some day, I read uh, in some uh, social uh, media that uh, activist uh, intelligence uh, uh, could replace uh, 300 million uh, employees worldwide. It's some kind uh, uh, as the terminator for employee. It is, in fact, the case. Uh, so uh, we should have some, uh, some uh, close look at the uh, uh, strength and uh, weakness of interface intelligence. Uh, interface intelligence uh, can, uh, in fact, uh, very good uh, uh, um, uh, recognize uh, um, uh, um, uh, some uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, settings, some uh, character uh, characteristic from the uh, from learning of a huge uh, uh, big data and from the uh, human behavior. Uh, for example, uh, in the uh, in the case of car automotive, um, uh, the AI can in fact. Uh, uh, um, control the car without um, uh, the support of the human. But the point is uh, uh, AI has also to learn as a human. And AI do make false positive at the human counterpart. And if the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the background, if the sit sit situation has disruptive changes. AI should have also the same uh, difficult, uh, difficulties as the uh, human counterpart. And that is the point, because um, uh, uh, cyber security uh, uh, um, background change rapidly and dramatically. No one can say which kind of, uh, of um, cyber threats you could have next month, next year. And that is the point. You should not uh, set all your pennies on the same car. And first, you should uh, uh, only need, be, uh, beside the AI, also the human counterpart. I mean, AI can, uh, for example, uh, 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 ver very good um, the enrichment in some the, uh, the, uh, in some the, uh, uh, um, uh, topics of uh, cyber security activities such as uh, uh, network analysis, um, uh, endpoint security, or uh, user behavior analysis. But uh, uh, AI cannot replace fully the um, uh, cyber specialist. They can relieve it. They can relieve the cyber security uh, specialist from uh, uh, daily uh, routine to work, such as uh, uh, the analyze of um, uh, of a network and enrich them to all the activities, such as uh, uh, data scientist on the on the security architect. So, in my opinion, AI could replace some routine uh, activities of cyber uh, specialists, but AI cannot replace all of them. I'm glad to hear that um, AI actually can do routine, but not the 
all of the cyber specialists. Otherwise, um, as a CISO, it's almost like it's the Korean endpoint in that sense. <laughs> so um, just touching on your comment, if I may just uh, ask Prof uh, Wei Han. So following up from uh, Kwan Vu's uh, comment, how do you see AI as a game changer? Especially because you are training the next generation of spy cyber talents for Singapore. So how would this actually impact cyber security education for better or for worse? What's your view? Uh, I agree with Kwang Wu just now that uh, he said that AI will not replace uh, um, the need for cyber, uh, cyber talent uh, entirely. And that's kind of true because one, we, we have a shortage anyway, so we need to find ways of optimizing uh, you know, what we have. So yes, using AI to automate the boring tasks, as we will call it, is something that makes sense because then it leaves the human who have higher cognitive abilities to perform uh, the better task. Now, what that translates to also, it means that uh, for us as uh, educators, we need to train our people to do those kind of things, right, that AI could not produce. Um, I mean, this uh, chat GPT is something that's uh, released recently. I'm quite sure a lot of you have tried it, uh, you know, to a certain extent. Uh, it's, it, it's something that I tried recently, and uh, yeah, it could generate, for example, uh, quite useful information, uh, but looking at it currently, it probably would not replace a human. Uh, if, let's say, for example, I'm using ChatGPT to ask, I ask it, hey, you know, can you help me to write a piece of code to target a particular system? Uh, it probably would not give me uh, fully usable code. I would probably still need to put in my contextual awareness of what systems I'm targeting, uh, what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to achieve at the end of the day, what data I'm trying to exfiltrate, for example, uh, into the maybe the skeleton code that's generated. So the idea here is when we teach our students now, we teach them to work with AI. And students are adapting to it uh, from what we're seeing. In, in my recent lessons, for example, um, I, I give CTFs for my students to try during, uh, to uh, as assessments, actually. So it's a CTF, you hack, you get points. Uh, if you cannot hack, you well, you don't get points, you, you might fail the, the assessment. So what I see this year in particular is that students, the first thing that they do is they open the chat GPT window. <laughs> and I was looking at some of the students say, well, I'd like to see you try and see if you can actually get the answer to my CTF from that. So uh, the truth is, um, it does produce something, but th then the students will still need to work on whatever that chat GPT produces. So yeah, we, we see a changing shift in terms of uh, how we teach our students what we prepare them for. In the past, we prepare them for everything. Now we say that, hey, you know, maybe you can leverage on generative AI to create something, and then you work from there on. Yes, um, in fact, I mentioned that I use chat GPT as part of my opening remark. It's helpful to a certain extent indeed. And we cannot run away from the fact that besides the evol uh, evolving cyber threat and risk, there's an evolving technology that uh, we can tap on to leverage on to help us in cyber security work, especially um, in the fact that uh, ISC Square study that showed that there is a shortfall of 3.4 million. So we need to find that balance in that sense as technology evolves. So touching on the point about technology, so uh, Captain Santosan, so what do you see from a classification perspective? Do you see any specific area of uh, capability that require any form of specific attention, especially for ships? Because ships itself is another very different type of system as compared to onshore port system. So in your view, what are the current uh, cyber security capabilities to tackle uh, in that sense in the maritime? Can I have your view, please? Thank you, Jimby. And uh, from classification society point of view, I believe cybersecurity framework is the best way for ships, which is uh, identify, protect, respond, detect, respond, and recover. However, uh, detect, respond, and recover is not yet matured for ships. Then I would like to draw your attention to the importance of cyber incident management depends on the ships. So normally, the ship management company set up the cyber incident and the cyber security management. And uh, I think it will be necessary to tackle cyber incident with collaboration among related stakeholder. I think cyber security capability will be strengthened 
するインシデントマネジメントアバングシップマネージャークリューオンボードエクイプメントマニファクチャーズアンドサイバーセキュリティエクスパートインタームズオブレイティストインフォメーションシェアリングアバウトサイバーインシデント Thank you, Chibi. Indeed,、um, I would like to leave some time for Q and A later on. So I would just like to、um, have the last question to Martin. So, in in view, we we spoke a lot. We talk about retention. We talk about technology disruption of AI. We talk about、uh, in the need for cyber insurance. These are very key. Points that I think have given our audience some food for thoughts after this. But in your view, how do you think we can form a collaborative ecosystem to solve some of the pressing cybersecurity capabilities issues in the maritime community, specifically from a port authority point of view or operator point of view? To you, Martin. Thank you, Jinbeng, for that small question. <laughs> well.、Um, Um, well, first of all, interesting technologies, AI and so on. I, I do not think they will solve、uh, this. I think the key to success when it comes to, to this question is the will to share,、uh, and by that I mean will to share information between each other, and also will to share experiences from this. Area, because depending on different cultures, different ways of working,、uh, different strategic decisions, we tend to do things in different ways, of course, and that means strength to me, because the diversity that brings will make us strong together.、Um, We can put it、uh, in the, the expression not to, to put all eggs in, in the same basket, because when you think of it in an example where we could go together and use the same service and try to build a super strong、um, defense, then we only are one goal for the attackers. Then we only have one attack surface, so to speak. So, so the diversity is is a key, I believe,、uh, in this、um, collaboration that you asked about. I totally agree with you in that sense.、Um, the efforts of、uh, cybersecurity is a team sport、um, because of the transboundary nature of our business, because of the way we are digitalizing in the next coming years. So definitely, we need to work. Uh, within the various、uh, verticals, there's within、uh, Singapore and also with like-minded partners across the region. I mean, just look at the stage here. We have Speaker Willie just now from the North America. We have、uh, Asia Pacific. We have the European size in Singapore. And it speaks volumes the fact that cybersecurity actually is a transboundary nature of issues. And, and I think we have a great responsibility to take here to to show the way,、uh, both in the collaboration and also、uh, we've heard about business continuity planning today、um, and, and everything this comes together. I, I think we have a responsibility there for the society to make sure logistics and and port operation works. Definitely, and definitely we have the responsibility towards our port, as you mentioned, as a business risk. Okay. Um, I'd like to leave the next、um, about six minutes to the questions that is coming on stream.、Uh, I think there's quite a lot of questions、um, that are coming on board. So pardon me that I will just pick、um, a few that is of the higher、uh, vote.、Um, okay, while、well, it's coming on screen,、um, let me read these particular questions. The question here is, how does the panel define? Capability development and what efforts are ongoing in that area in the organization represented by the panel. So I think it's a very interesting questions because we do have representative from classification from port and from I mean for shipping from classification also from the academic. So、um, maybe 
each of you, I will pose these questions in terms of capability development to um, the academic first. Dr. Wei Han. Uh, yep, so um, if I were to talk about capability development, I would say there's uh, building, uh, yeah, building people, um, preparing them for the industry, preparing them so that they're able to work in the industry. Uh, and what we are doing, at least um, from SIT, um, the university where I'm from, um, we have a degree program, for example, in cybersecurity, where we train uh, young talents in, uh, in uh, cybersecurity, and then we put them out to work for an uh, internship for a year, and then after that, they, they graduate, and then they can continue with the company if the company finds them suitable. Uh, but we are doing much more than just that. Uh, we are looking at, uh, for example, more innovative ways to upskill uh, talents, right? Because some people may have already, for example, let's say a degree uh, in computer science or in some other IT field, and they, they say, hey, you know, I want to get into cyber. And those are the people that we, we actually welcome and we actually want them to come on board because we, we need the people. So we are looking at ways like, for example, micro-credentials, where we have like uh, four-month-long programs to, uh, you know, to, to build a capability in cybersecurity, it won't make them an expert overnight, but at least allow them to pivot into cybersecurity and then you know continue from there on. Uh, the industry itself uh, have a lot of certifications. So these are for, for example, people already in cybersecurity. Let's say uh, they're doing some cyber, uh, let's say they're doing penetration testing and they want to be certified or they want to go up the, the, to basically level up the next level. There's a lot of certifications out there. Uh, to, to do these kind of things, uh, whether it's in penetration testing, in forensics, in incident handling, and and so on, so that's uh yeah that's that's generally the the ecosystem. Uh, in addition to that, of course, there are short courses um, which uh, we think that um, will be good for you know the management of companies to actually uh, attend to to know about because um, like what uh, many panelists are saying, um, cybersecurity is a team sport. It's not an individual game. You may have the best cybersecurity team. Right, comprising of the most talented individuals who can hack into anything, who can defend anything, but if uh, management doesn't give priority to cybersecurity, that's going to be a problem uh, eventually. Yeah. Thank you, and I totally agree with you. I mean, there's a series of uh, programs that various uh, colleagues that's on the panel here are, I believe, adopting in their respective uh, port uh, and uh, classification society that you are de uh, delivering to your ecosystems within your own uh, domains. Uh, similarly, for MPA, um, we are heavily invested in terms of capability development uh, in both in technologies and also in terms of uh, people development. Uh, in terms of um, technology, last year, we, we, capability development can be defined as both the technology and the people. So we last year, we invested from technology fronts about $4.8 million through Singapore Maritime Institute to build the world first um, test bed for shipboard systems to be able to help to train the next generation of cyber professional to be able to use it to um, train existing companies that are uh, having cyber uh, professionals to be able to test bed new cyber products and most importantly, to be able to kind of um, cyber ranging exercises between uh, regions. That's from technology front. From the people part, which is also very important, we are working very closely with um, the Institute of Higher Learning in Singapore, um, including SIT, um, to look at how we can translate today's IT professional into OT, cyber security, and from those who are non-IT into cyber security, for those that are PMET, we're also looking at the pipeline of cybersecurity, um, young talents that we can green harvest to help them to join the maritime industry. The presentation that Captain uh, Saito-san and also Kwang Fu mentioned clearly is that there are specifics in maritime domains that is different from other sectors. And there, as we digitalize, there are a lot of interesting opportunities that we can have to attract and continue retain and retrain talents to remain in uh, maritime. So now I have time, looking at the clock, I have 35 seconds, but I would like to take and share on one last question, if I may show on the screen. And the question is this, how do you keep cyber professionals already operating in the maritime domain motivated to remain in maritime? 
So if I may pose this question to Kwan Vu. Okay, thank you. This is, uh, in fact, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, complicated uh, question. So uh, as I uh, mentioned before, you could uh, not motivate the, the professional with money because we don't have enough money. <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, that's not all uh, because uh, the, uh, the new generation of professional uh, 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 do have, uh, um, uh, um, uh, luckily, all, all the fo focus on the uh, on the on the um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, working life. So work life balance is also very important. So we we have uh, uh, we uh, we give uh, our um, uh, um, uh, cyber pro 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 professional at an early stage enough uh, responsible. They they could uh, uh, um, uh, work. Uh, uh, more or less independently. Uh, the point is, uh, we have um, uh, um, uh, some uh, some uh, 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 we, we set some goal for uh, for their working, and uh, they they have them um, more or less the uh, uh, the freedom how to achieve this goal, and uh, and. There, uh, there, there is no strict control on the world. So the, uh, that they have the, the possibility to realize their work-life balance. And that could be some uh, uh, specific, uh, specific advantage uh, comparable to other sector, for, for example. Uh, the point is, Money is not all for the working, the working life. Indeed, I think passion speaks a lot too in, in your chosen profession. So uh, without, in the interest of time, please join me in uh, thanking the panelists for today's session. And I, I definitely have um, learned quite a lot from them. Okay. So um, this marks um, the end of uh, today's session. I hope that um, you've given you some food for thoughts uh, uh, on regards and a better appreciation of cybersecurity and the challenges and the, and the interest in uh, maritime sector. If not, thank you very much for your attendance to this session. Thank you. <laughs>